Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple announcements for um, here first. And the first one is there are some of these flyers on the Welcome Center out there, and it's about the free um, the watch party for the chosen. So it will begin at six o'clock for eight Sundays, beginning June twelfth. Um, so you can pick up one of these on there to remind you and um, come and all watch together. And then another real important one is summer hours start next week, which means there's an 8.30 service and 10 o'clock, but no Sunday school in between. So that starts ne next week. And the last one I want to share is there are some devotional books out on the tables outside, um, a variety of them. And please just help yourself and, and take one of those. So um, the first I want to start with today, first I want to start in James which says every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights and then i want to go into corinthians here but i just want to say if everything comes from god um, don't compare to yourself to other people don't boast and most off uh, most especially don't judge yourself or others as first corinthians says for what makes you different from anyone else what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? So a good thing to keep in mind as we go through life and um, just be so thankful for what God has given us and to see, see and love other people. So let's stand and sing this morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
as we pause to worship and praise your name, help us to find ourselves through your grace and give ourselves through your love as we proclaim your mercy to the world. Amen. Good morning. We come to the end of our Sunday school year this year, and so I want to just take a minute and recognize those that have been teaching the past year. And our church is so blessed to have people that each week work on making a lesson for their students, to come and share the love of Jesus with their students, and to pray for their students during the week. And um, they just share it with the adults and the children and the families of our church, and we are just blessed. And God calls all of us to continue to grow in our knowledge and wisdom, and then to take that knowledge and wisdom and go to tell others what we've seen and heard and learned about Jesus. So that's a challenge for all of us. Um, and here's just a poem that I found that I just think speaks to their place in our lives and something for each of you to think about, about the teacher that helps you learn this year. Thank you for the time you give to each who looks to you you truly make a difference by all you say and do. For as you touch each heart, you leave your imprint there. And always they'll remember you how much you really cared. Keep on loving. Keep on caring. Sharing Christ as you do. For one day they'll return to say, teacher, I thank you. You've made a difference in my life. I am who I am today because you gave your time to teach and show me God's way. And I think that's true about our teachers, that they do that all the time. So this morning, we wanna just recognize the people who have served faithfully this year. And if they just stand where they are, and then afterwards, pick up a plant here that's been made for them, that'd be great. Our nursery class, our very little ones, Jenny Kalen and Julie Syke, and some of these people worship at second. So beginners with Shannon Gillison, Primary class was Kim Shadwick. The youth class was Donna Brown. And the adults, um, there were two classes, Gary Watterson and Cynthia Brisky and Shelly Nero. So all these people have served this year and just made a difference in our lives. And we also wanna just offer thanks to Sarah Esper and Dodie Putney and Jeff 
and Brenda Jordan, who have done the AV help back there for the adult class, so those people. And then a final thank you to the folks that provided leadership for our midweek studies this year. Bruce Kalin and Ron Janish for the men's group and Sue Spalding and myself for the women's group. So we're just very thankful for all these people. And Pastor Bob's gonna just come up and just ask a blessing over all these folks. And then there'll be the children's moment. Thank you, Carolyn. Can we pray? Well, Holy God, teachers are absolutely so important in our lives, and they are a gift from you, and we thank you for each and every one and all the various manifestations that they come to our lives. Thank you especially today for the, the leaders in our church that step up and serve you and help us to know you better, God, and just ask you to bless them today and always, and just to keep walking alongside of them, filling them with your power, your strength, and your joy. Amen. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, I really am. <laughs> oh, very good. And I brought another friend with me today. Did you see that? This is this is my friend. He really doesn't have a name. I really haven't named him. I guess I should. But anyway, I wanted to show you a special friend of mine. Now, I am a teddy bear collector. Now, I'm not so much anymore, but it used to be in my house, there was a teddy bear in every room. And not so much anymore because they get dusty and I'm getting tired of dusting. I really am. Anyway, I still keep him out because he's my favorite one. I have little ones. I have medium sized ones. I have big ones, but he's my favorite. So I keep him out all the time. Anyway, I'm going to put him right here because he's going to help us with our lesson today. <laughs> He's never been to church before, so, you know. Do you know why I like teddy bears? Because when I look at a teddy bear, I look at his face, and I look at his body, and he makes me smile. He makes me happy. I mean, they're not real, but it just makes me feel comforted and happy. When I thought about what, what gives me comfort it's teddy bears. I just love teddy bears. I love pictures of teddy bears. I love all kinds of things. In fact, I have a friend that's kind of like me. And did you know that at Christmas time, she has a teddy bear tree in her house, one of her rooms, and there's nothing on that tree but teddy bears. I love it. I've never done that, but I'm thinking about doing that. But that would be really cool. Now, the reason why I like teddy bears, like I told you, is because they bring me a lot of comfort and I'll walk into a room and I just smile when I see that face. Now, when you have stuffed animals like that, look at their face and see what kind of personality they have. Look at their eyes. When you get home today and you have your stuffed animals, look at their eyes, look at their nose and their mouth. They have all personalities. Did you know that? And look at their faces because they're all different. They're all different. Well, I have a story today about Jesus, and he has nothing to do with stuffed animals, but he has something to do with comfort. He was talking to his disciples, and he was telling them some sad news, some sad news. He said, I know I've been here with you, but now I have to go back to heaven and be with my father. While the disciples, his followers, said, you can't leave us. You can't leave us because we don't know what to do. We don't know how to live. What are we supposed to do? And Jesus said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to leave you a gift. And I love that. Where'd you go? Yes. Um, Miss Deb read that verse about all perfect gifts. All gifts are, are from God. And you know what? This is a special gift that I'm telling you about today. And this gift is called the Holy Spirit because the disciples didn't know what to do. They knew that they followed Jesus around and took his advice and learned from him, but he was leaving them. And so he, they were in a panic 
And Jesus said, don't worry, I have a gift. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And you know what? We can have the Holy Spirit too. You know who the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is the part of God that lives in us if we are Jesus followers. So if you want to be a Jesus follower, you can have that gift too. And Jesus sent the gift of the Holy Spirit when he left this earth. And the job of the Holy Spirit is really confusing, but the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life oops, will give us comfort, just like a teddy bear can give comfort, but oh, so much better because the Holy Spirit is real and he's a helper. He'll help you every day in order to make the right decisions because we've got decisions to make every day, don't we? On how to behave, how to act. And the Holy Spirit will help us do the things that please God. They also, the Holy Spirit also helps us to connect with God. If you're ever reading your Bible or you're hearing about the Bible and it seems kind of confusing, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the Bible. He helps us to connect to God better. And we can get to know God better through the Holy Spirit. He helps us to pray too. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but when I pray sometimes, I don't know exactly what to say. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit helps us to say the right words or to explain the right things to God, Father, who will help us to connect better with God. And it helps us with our faith. And I love it, the fact that it can be a comforting thing when you're feeling lonely or you're afraid of something. Now, what do kids usually do when they're afraid of something? What do they hang on to? I hang on to a bear. Sometimes kids hang on to blankets. Is that true? That's true. Sometimes that gives them comfort. Sometimes going to mom and dad gives them comfort, but the Holy Spirit can give you comfort too. All you have to do is talk to him and say, help me feel better and show me what to do in order to connect with God better. And I love that, that that's a gift that we get too, if we want to be followers of Jesus. And Jesus said, he doesn't want us to be worried. He said, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled in your heart or in your mind. I want to give you comfort through my gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we get that spirit automatically when we decide to be Jesus followers. And then Jesus said, not only will I give you somebody to comfort you while I'm gone, but I'm coming back to get you because I want to spend forever with you because he loves you so much that he wanted to give you a helper through, to get through your days and to teach you about God. And then someday Jesus will be coming back for us too, for all of his followers. Let's pray and thank him for that. Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for us, but I also thank you for the Holy Spirit who works so hard in our lives, and I pray that you will help us to remember that and to show love to other people and to have the Holy Spirit work in our lives. I pray for that for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you for coming up. Good morning. Let us begin with a prayer for, of illumination. Teach us, Lord, as we open up your word. Touch our hearts and our minds so that we will apply your truths to our daily lives. And send us your Holy Spirit, please, so that all that we say and all that we do will bring honor and glory to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is from the book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 16 verses 9 through 15. It can be found on page 898 of your pew Bible, or you can follow along on the screen. <clears throat> Acts 16. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Trous, we put out and to the sea and sailed straight for Salamothrace. 
The next day, we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of, the dis of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who were gathered there. One of them, one of, sorry, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyria named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household had been baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us to, to stay. Our second lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John. John chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. It's found on page 875 in your pew Bibles. It's titled, Jesus Promises the Holy Spirit. It's John 14, 23. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. We have what appears to be a teaching theme today. Maybe you've noticed. Not only are we celebrating our teachers this morning here in the church, but our scripture lessons are all about teaching as well. Our reading from Acts, for instance, talks about the Apostle Paul being taught by the Holy Spirit in a vision, and then he, in turn, starts teaching the Macedonians. And in our reading from John, we find Jesus teaching his disciples in the upper room on the night before he was crucified, promising by the way, that same Holy Spirit that Paul encountered, who will teach you all things, says Jesus, and remind you of what I've already said. There's a definite teaching theme, isn't there? And we're in a teaching season as well. Graduations are unfolding all around us. Seniors are deciding what it is they're going to do next. And in case you haven't noticed, there's an educational controversy on the news almost daily. What should we teach? And at what age? How should we teach it? Is in-person better than online? Should higher education even cost? How about for those who've already taken out loans? Are you with me? Is it fair to say that teaching's important? Last week, we talked about Peter up on the rooftop being taught who is welcome at the table of the Lord versus who is not who's welcome to hear the gospel, to be taught the good news of Jesus Christ. And today we have almost a mere image of last week's lesson. Instead of Peter sharing the gospel with Cornelius, though, a Gentile, after having that cheat-lowering vision, we see Paul reaching out to the Gentiles, including capitalists and merchants and even women. Scandal. Everyone is welcome, like we talked about last week. Again, that's pretty clear. Everyone's invited. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, said Jesus. Anyone. It's simple, really. God loves you, all of you, so much so, in fact, that he sent his own son as a sacrificial atonement for your sins. All you have to do is claim that gift for yourself. It's a universal offer one that comes with a promise, a big promise. 
If you love me and keep my commands, I will ask the Father to send you an advocate in my name, the Spirit of truth. He will not only remind you of everything that I've already taught you, but teach you even more. We will come to those who obey my teaching and make our home with you. And I'm telling you this ahead of time so that when it happens, you'll believe. The welcome mat's out. Everyone's invited. Only, apparently, not everyone's teachable. Did you notice that part? Not everyone will obey my teaching, Jesus continues, specifically those who do not love me. Teaching's critical then, isn't it? And you can't teach what you don't know, right? Oh, you can share information, but you can't teach. So think back for a moment to someone who shared an important life lesson with you Mrs. Smith, your beloved first grade teacher, maybe, or Mr. Jones from high school biology, Mrs. Johnson, your favorite Sunday school teacher, maybe a foreman at the very first place where you worked. I remember my first real job, not mowing lawns or delivering papers, not working for someone dad knew. This was a real job. I was a busboy at one of the top 10 restaurants in the state of Michigan at the ripe old age of 14. I had to ride my bicycle to get there and then home again late at night. This was a classy place with multiple forks and spoons on each side of the plate. There was even a little knife up at the top with a little plate all of its own. And the head busboy taught me a lot, like how important it is to kill all the cockroaches in the salad bar before you put the ice in. I remember a master electrician who would kick me in the backside hard every time I touched an electrical box with the front of my hand instead of the back of my hand. It was his vision of safety training. I remember a gifted crane operator who taught me all the secrets and how to weld and track deer and shoot a bow. He was the smartest man I have ever known, bar none, even though he never finished high school. He even tried to teach me how to bend neon on several occasions. So who mentored you? And who have you mentored in return? A close relative, maybe? A trusted friend? A youth leader or camp counselor? Your band director or football coach? A pastor, maybe? I remember the Reverend Ray Gaylord, who I met at camp and all the things that he taught me. I remember the Reverend Al Waterworth, who taught me so much about people and life, not to mention theology, Deb's grandpa, by the way. And I remember the Reverend Robert Collier, a fiery Southern Baptist preacher from Mississippi, who went by the name of Pastor Bubba. And believe me, he embodied all of those stereotypical images that just went through your mind. Several years ago, Pastor Bubba shared with me one of his favorite teachers, Mahatma Gandhi. I'm assuming that you all have heard of him. Gandhi's credited with founding the nonviolent civil disobedient movement. People like Martin Luther King Jr. took their cues from him. Gandhi was a prolific writer and a masterful theologian. He studied most of the holy books of most of the world religions diligently. He was a deeply pious man who prayed all the time. In fact, he was on his knees so much that over the years, thick calluses started to form. He was a mystic, really, a strong man of faith who incorporated all kinds of spiritual disciplines into his life, including fasting. Gandhi went for long periods of time without ever drink, eating or drinking anything but water, and he did this to achieve clarity in both thought and in his prayer life. That practice, though, took a toll on his health over time he became very weak and quite susceptible to disease and infection. And even when he did eat, Gandhi was a strict vegetarian. This too brought on a number of health issues, the most notable of which was something like trench mouth. Those close to him often complained that he had terrible breath. Pastor Bubba, one of my mentors, shared with me that Gandhi, one of his mentors, was not only a gifted teacher, but he was a super calloused, fragile mystic hexed with halitosis. 
Teachers are a gift, aren't they? A good teacher can touch your heart as well as open up your mind to truth. And they'll do it in such a way that it comes alive. A good teacher will not only take the time to get to know you, but they will allow you to get to know them. Today, Jesus is sitting in the midst of his disciples, his students, his would-be followers, and he says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And the Father will send to them a teacher, the Spirit of truth. Now think about that. Or maybe question yourself on that. Do you love Jesus enough to obey his teaching? Because if you do, and I quote, my Father will love you and we will come to you and make our home with you. My Father will send you an advocate, the Holy Spirit, in my name who will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. It's a promise, a big promise. So do you love Jesus enough to obey him? Do you realize that um, liturgically speaking, the church is in between right now? We're sandwiched between Easter, where we receive the gift of salvation, and Pentecost, where we receive the promised comforter and guide. The parades of Palm Sunday are over, including the shouts of Hosanna as Messiah rides into town in honor and glory. The agony of the crucifixion is over as well, as are those brief moments where we stood outside the empty tomb in confusion, or maybe in awe. We've had our time of being scattered in fear like the first disciples or holed up, locked away, hiding. And before we know it, we'll arrive at the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church. And that's important. So stay with me because I want to teach a little bit about Jewish holidays and Christian parables. Parallel. I mean, it is teaching season, right? On the third day after Passover, where the angel of death passes over the household of the faithful, the celebration of freedom from slavery and bondage, on what we call Easter, the day Jesus conquered death, is the celebration of first fruits in Israel for the barley harvest. And 50 days after that is Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost in the Greek, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So listen for the echoes. It was on Shavuot, according to Jewish calendars, that Moses received the law on Mount Sinai 50 days after leaving Egypt. And on Shavuot, Pentecost, that the church received the Holy Spirit 50 days after leaving the locked upper room. Seven weeks after being released from bondage in Egypt, the people of God received teaching at Sinai. And seven weeks after being released from bondage at the cross of Calvary, the people of God received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit who promises to teach us even more. The disciples went from a group of about 120 back then, locked away, cowering in fear, to over 3,000 out on the streets of Jerusalem, boldly declaring the good news. God's teaching through the power of the Holy Spirit began to produce first fruits. Teaching is absolutely critical. And so apparently is obeying what the Lord has taught us. And the reward for that's huge. The Holy Spirit of God will come and reside in our hearts. That's quite a trade-off. Obedience in exchange for supernatural power and wisdom and peace. It's the same promise, by the way, given to us in the Great Commission. Matthew 28 says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you always, even to the end of time. So how are we doing with that charge? Are we teaching others what Jesus said and did? Are we teaching them to obey? Are we as a nation 
honoring the Lord's values as opposed to those of the world? Are we as parents and grandparents, neighbors and friends, sharing what it is that we know to be true? How much time and energy do you think we put in that? How much learning or teaching do we actually do? Have you read personally every jot and tittle in God's word? Do you know what it says? Are you trying even now to incorporate those truths into your life? Do you share these with your family? How about your neighbors and friends? I mean, if you love them, why wouldn't you want them to know? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, and anyone who does not love me will not. It's kind of in your face, isn't it? But then it's Jesus who's doing the teaching. This obedience thing's not an add-on to Christianity. It's not for the super pious. It's the very basis of who we are and what we believe. If we love Jesus, we will do what he says, which includes passing that truth on to others. Let me give you an example. Lydia, in our first reading this morning, is a, quote, God-fearing woman, we're told, and a worshiper of God. She's currently in the city of Philippi, but comes from the city of Thyatira. She's also a dealer in purple cloth. And what all that means is she believes in the one true God, but does not yet know Jesus or the Holy Spirit personally. She owns her own business. She's not relying on anyone else for her financial support. And she travels for work. (coughs) The fact that she deals in purple cloth tells us that she rubs elbows with the wealthy. Only the rich and famous could afford purple cloth, and therefore, purple was the color of royalty. Lydia is a somebody, a somebody who knows a lot of somebody. She's also a woman who knows a lot about God, but has never seen him in the face of a son. It's only after Paul shares the gospel with her, teaches her about Jesus Christ, and only after God opens up her heart to receive the good news that Lydia begins to understand the truth. Only then does she meet God personally. And there's more teaching happening around this lesson too. There's a teaching directly from the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus has promised. Prior to this encounter, the Spirit of God actually changed Paul's traveling itinerary two different times. Did you know that? Paul and his companions want to go preach in the province of Asia, but the Holy Spirit prevents him from doing so. Then they tried to enter Bithynia, but, quote, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow us to. Paul wants to go east and then north, but in a vision, God sends him west. The Spirit's teaching Paul, and Paul's open to that teaching, and then he's obedient in the following of that teaching. Paul leaves Traus, a port city in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and travels to Neapolis in Macedonia, modern-day Greece. Big picture-wise, what that means is, by the teaching of the Spirit, the gospel crosses yet another boundary and moves from Asia Minor into Europe. Now watch. It's the Sabbath, so Paul and his friends go out of the city and down to the river and talk with a group of women. Again, by the teaching of the Holy Spirit, a boundary is crossed, a social boundary, men talking with women and treating them as equals. It's amazing, really, how if we just listen to the teaching of the Holy Spirit, we'll know right from wrong, isn't it? And if we're obedient, wonderful things happen. So have you ever had a time in your life when you felt nudged by the Spirit to do something or not to do something? If so, were you obedient to that nudge? I remember a few times when I wasn't. There was a man's house that I drove by every day. I didn't know him. I'd never met him. I didn't even know his name. But I often felt that God was telling me to stop and introduce myself. I didn't. And a couple of months later, I heard that he had died. When Deb and I were first married, one of her friends, Jolene, was a ballet teacher who 
toured with a professional dance company. Well, one day, Deb came home from class and said, I feel like we should give Jolene our car. I thought she was nuts, and I told her so. We didn't have an extra car, nor the money to buy another one. Besides, Jolene hadn't asked for a car, let alone ours. Jolene was in her early 20s at the time, a professional dancer in top physical condition, and about three weeks after that conversation, Jolene died of a massive heart attack. I also remember a few times when I did listen to the Spirit of God nudging my heart. There were several stories around the selling of our business, but one in particular almost seems like a testimony. We bought our house downstate from my parents. It was a wonderful boyhood home out in the country at the end of a quiet road. Jacent to our property was a gorgeous 66-acre parcel of land, one that I wanted ever since I was very young. On one side, it abutted Fort Custer State Park. On another, the Kalamazoo River. On the third side, there was a beautiful stream with two ponds. On the fourth, it backed right up to our property. There were two small creeks running through the back of the property, lots of deer, and hundreds of Purdue walnut trees, specially planted and trimmed, that would one day be worth a fortune. There was even underground irrigation system that watered each and every one. It was perfect. Well, I talked the owner into selling it to us. We agreed on the terms far less than it was actually worth. The bank approved the loan immediately over the phone and at a fantastic rate. Everything was set except the signatures. Well, Deb and I always pray over such things, usually for a day or two, so we did. The very next day we talked after work, we both wanted that property very much. In fact, I still do but we both were feeling as if God was telling us no. It was clear in our hearts, even though the desire and the means to buy it were all there. So with some regrets, a whole heap of regrets, and a ton of questions on both of our parts, we backed out of the deal. My banker was actually mad. The owner of the property was furious. And I got to tell you, I was extremely disappointed myself, but less than 24 hours after we made that difficult decision, a little church in northern Michigan named Blaine Christian Church called and asks us out of the blue if we'd like to be considered to share in their ministry. Just think of all the blessings we would have missed had we not listened to and obeyed the Spirit's teaching. And just think how meaningless this true story of ours would be and how quickly it would die if we didn't periodically share it with others. We're currently standing between Easter and Pentecost, between the promise and the fulfillment. It wasn't that long ago that we witnessed the empty tomb, and in just a little while more, we'll experience the birth of the church with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what do you say? What have we learned? How should we spend our time in the in-between? How about we try our best to obey what the Lord is teaching us and just watch what happens as Pentecost unfolds? And all of God's people said, amen. I invite you to listen for the Holy Spirit nudging your hearts as we stand and sing our praise songs. Will you please stand?
Each week we come together as a family of God and we share with one another our joys and our concerns and lift them up before the Lord in prayer. There are a number of prayer requests on the back of your bulletin. Please take these folks with you and pray for them by name this week. We have some additions. Um, Kathy LaCrone, who is Elaine Putney's sister, has been put on hospice, so we'd like to keep her in our prayers. Also, the tornado victims in Gaylord, um, that was quite the thing. Elaine Putney um, is out of Munson and back at the Homesteader. Uh, she's got COVID um, but um, and therefore isolated. A lot of folks in the Homesteader seem to have that. And so, um, but please keep her, give her calls, keep her in your prayers and, and cards and things. Also, uh, Carl and Elizabeth, uh, Carl Teets and Elizabeth Merrill were married yesterday. And so we'd like to celebrate uh, their new family together. Are there other, oh, and Dahlia and Sam were married yesterday. I went to the one, I missed the other. And their new last name, Jenny? Emery, E-R-Y, thank you. I picked on you because you went, oh yeah. <laughs> Are there others we'd like to share this morning? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would share with my aunt, Mary Esther Brooks, commonly known as Mutsy. She's uh, very near the end of her life. We'll keep her lifted up, Jackie. And uh, safe travels for Doug and I as we go to see our grandkids. Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations. Next weekend, she will be back. Okay. Awesome. And it's our anniversary. Well, happy anniversary. How many? 14. Awesome. Congratulations. Seeing no others, could we be in a spirit of silent prayer together? Oh, Lord. Thank you for being present with us through your Holy Spirit. Thank you for teaching us, Lord, and for the counsel of your Spirit in our hearts and in our minds. And Lord, thank you for moving all the human teachers and mentors into our lives, enabling us to become all that we were designed to be. Father, you've given us so much, and for this we glorify your holy name. We sing your praises and song and exalt your name above all names. We honor you with our gifts, Lord, and commune with you in prayer. And we lift you up above all the worldly idols around us. Lord, we call upon you today in prayer, beseeching you for gifts and graces and petitioning you with our worries and our concerns. It is in trust and confidence that we lay these burdens down before your altar of grace. So, Father, please hear our prayers. Please touch the lives of Kathy LeCrone and all the tornado victims. Please touch Elaine Putney and Carl and Elizabeth and Dahlia and Sam. Please touch Mary Esther Brooks, Lord, and uh, please give safe travels to Doug and Jackie and all those who are traveling. Be with those who are silently on our hearts right now and those on our prayer list. Please strengthen those who are weak and heal those who are broken. And please, Lord, love those who need your unconditional love right now and help us to do the same. 
please also be with this church as we strive to transform ourselves into who it is that you're calling us to be. Please guide us as we attempt to discern your voice calling us to your future. And please heal our hearts so that together we might fully serve your world. These things we ask in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Spirit as we pray together now the very prayer that he has taught to us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus tells us that no one comes to the Father except through the Son. We can't fully know God without first looking at Jesus. He's the example. He's the smiling face of our Lord that we have. He's the example that we've seen all through Scripture. And the Holy Spirit helps us to understand each and every little piece of that. When we come to the table, we see the love of God most freely given in the cross of Calvary, and we're reminded just how special we are. Say we pray. Come and stir our souls with your spirit, Lord. When we are paralyzed by fear or apathy, may we see the living Christ inviting us to be whole. We come to this table knowing that Christ is the living water, the healing presence, the caring friend that we need to help us back onto our feet. Bless this bread and help us remember Christ as we partake. Bless this cup and help us to know the awesome reality of the love that does not stop, even at the cross. <laughs> we pray that we are fed here, that we may hear and discern your spirit's call and follow its lead wherever you may have us go. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup. And after giving thanks for it, he gave this to the disciples. And he said, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. These things do in remembrance of me. Everyone who believes Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is welcome at this table. Just come forward, break off a small piece of bread, dip it in the cup and partake, and gather around our sanctuary for our closing benediction. Come, for all things are now ready.
like to remind you that elders are available to talk with you or pray for you after this service, that if today's not convenient, they'd love to hear from you throughout the week. Our benediction today <clears throat> comes from Jude, the very first verse. To those who have been called, who are loved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. Thank you.